Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. All right. Uh, so today's interesting. You know, the topic of today is uh, kind, of, kind of interesting. Uh, so that's good. And uh, uh, at first, uh, we're just gonna like uh, continue doing the thing that we were doing last time, which is uh, uh, partial derivatives. So let's talk about that a little more before we move to uh, the next idea. So today's the 19th. And uh, just to uh, remind you <coughs> uh, of, the, of the way things are, is that uh, you know in uh, college algebra and uh, calculus one 1325 you consider uh, functions with this signature that is to say uh, you input uh, a number and uh, a number is output and uh, when you're doing that you could uh, for example say something like uh, let f of x be uh, you know say uh, exponential of uh, for, for, of 4x for like that, and then uh, say uh, minus x squared times the logarithm of x. So there's a nice function there. And then uh, you could do, uh, you know, the, from, from the differential point of view, you can, you can ask questions like, uh, well, uh, what about this? Please calculate uh, f prime of x. Okay, well, uh, this is this is knowledge you already have, so I'm just going to do this rapidly. Uh, the way one way to uh, to write it down is uh, you could write it like this: so derivative like so, exponential of uh, four times x. But uh, we all know that the derivative distributes, so I'll say that it's the derivative of the first thing, and then subtract uh, the derivative of the second thing, like so. And then uh, to do each of these, uh, to, to do each of these, you know, we've got uh, rules. So, for example, for this one, uh, we know that uh, the derivative with respect to x of exponential of x is just exponential of x. So, you know, if that were, if that uh, instead of being 4x, if it was exactly just x, then uh, that'd be the answer. But it's not. Uh, rather. Uh, it looks like this. The derivative with respect to x of the exponential of u, like so. So what I want you to observe is that uh, the differentiation symbol and the, and the argument are not in agreement. Uh, as a result, uh, we'll still get exactly the same exponential back. So, so far what I've written uh, looks exactly like uh, the rule above, but uh, it's what I've written so far is not correct. Uh, to make it right, we need to say what uh, the uh, the chain rule does. So uh, the chain rule goes on to say, okay, well then you have to multiply by the derivative with respect to x of uh, u, like that. So that's the that's the chain rule. All right, and then uh, you know for this one, what will we need? No, we're not doing any kind of antiderivative whatsoever. We're, we're doing derivatives, right? <laughs> but uh, you, you, I think you're on the right track because uh, the thing that we have to do is the derivative counterpart of the biparts thingy. So what's the name of it when you're doing derivatives? Or to say it in a kind of a silly way. <laughs> right. <laughs> what, uh, what rule do you think we should use to compute the derivative of this product? <laughs> Probably the product rule, right? Okay, so then uh, to, to remind you of that, is that uh, when you compute the derivative with respect to x of, uh, of a product, uh, since I already used u there, I'll write, uh, I don't know, v and w. You want to compute the derivative of the product of two things, then the product rule says that uh, the answer has to be the derivative of the first thing multiplied by the second and then plus the first thing multiplied by the derivative of the second. 
Okay, so that's the product rule. So in order to carry that out, uh, we'll need to do those things. Okay, so I'll do that. So as for this uh, first one, uh, derivative of exponential using the chain rule. So it'll be, we get the exponential uh, back, exponential of 4x, and then we have to multiply by the derivative of 4x. Okay, then uh, for the product rule, okay, so then subtract, uh, now I'll do the product rule. So uh, derivative with respect to x of x squared, multiply by log x, and then plus x squared multiplied by derivative of log of x. Now, there is something that is uh, not right about uh, what I've done here. What's not right about it? Yeah, some parentheses are missing. Because uh, have a look at what it's saying. We're uh, doing a you know, derivative of uh, that thing and then subtract a uh, derivative of that thing. So we need to, we need to subtract uh, all of that, right? So what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, if I were to put like uh, red parentheses around this, like that, then can you see that, uh, oh yeah, in fact, we need to put those here also. Because before I put those red parentheses, uh, we, were subtract uh, we were adding that term, but uh, we need to eventually be subtracting it. Is it clear? Okay, good. Then uh, finishing this up, this would be uh, exponential of 4x, multiply by 4, and then uh, subtract, derivative of x squared is uh, 2x, and then multiply log x, and then I'll distribute the subtraction now so that uh, we get uh, x squared multiplied by 1 over x, like so. Okay, and then, uh, you know, maybe you do some simplifying or whatever, but uh, at any rate, this is the answer. Any question about it? Okay. Uh, now, when we want to do, uh, you know, similar things, but uh, with functions of different signature, that is to say, now let's consider functions with this signature, r squared to r. Uh, what that means is that uh, now the functions have uh, two inputs. Uh, two, two real inputs and they, they produce a real output and uh, we still want to compute derivative imp like uh, derivative like information so here's here's an example is that uh, <clears throat> well we could say I don't know let uh, Q of uh, U and V say be equal to uh, 3 U squared multiplied by the exponential of 4u v squared and then uh, how about uh, subtract u to 8 over v to 5. Okay, so there's a nice uh, function of variables u and v. The only reason why I'm using u and v is I just don't want you to like uh, uh, get into a mistaken notion that x and y are somehow like special. They're not. They're just, they're just names. Okay, so here's a function of two variables. u is a real number, v is a real number, and then we combine them uh, like so to make another real number. Uh, so one thing uh, that uh, I can ask here is I can say, well, uh, would you please uh, calculate, uh, so what is it, when I write this, what does this mean? So we talked about this last time, but I want someone to uh, remind me. What does that mean? Right. So this means uh, we're going to compute uh, the partial derivative of q with respect to u. So partial derivative of q with respect to to uh, you, and uh, notably, and this is the place where, uh, at least at the beginning, many students get uh, caught up, is that uh, when you're doing this, what, uh, when, uh, when you're doing this, uh, v is constant.
with respect to you. Okay, that's the place where a lot of students get uh, mixed up. All right, let's do it. So uh, to do this, the U partial. So now, uh, just like, just like uh, in derivatives, there's two notations uh, for functions of signature reals to reals. Uh, we, you know, we just use that one, uh, d uh, over dx. Uh, but we also have this prime notation. So the analog to the prime notation in this context is the u subscript. We have to write u instead of like a prime because uh, if you just wrote prime, it wouldn't be clear if you were doing it with respect to u or with respect to v. Okay, so uh, we're, we're also going to compute the v partial, but uh, I'm going to use the, uh, the, the notation, I'm going to use one notation on one of them and the other notation on the other one. Uh, so for this one, I'm going to use that one. So partial with respect to uh, u, like that. Okay, and then, you know, partial derivative uh, distributes uh, just, like, uh, just like that one. So 3u squared exponential of 4u v squared, like so, and then uh, subtract partial with respect to u, u to 8 over v to 5. All right, so uh, again, t uh, to remind you, uh, that, uh, you know, that's not like a, that, that weird looking symbol, that's a, it's kind of a D looking thing, uh, but it's pronounced partial, and uh, yes, that is the way you have to write it. Uh, if you write it uh, like a Latin D, like that one, uh, essentially the distinction is, is that uh, when you write uh, these Ds, what you mean is that uh, I believe that there's exactly one variable and its name is X. Uh, and when you write uh, the partial symbol, what you're saying is that uh, I believe that there is more than one variable, uh, but uh, one of them is U. So what I'm saying is that uh, if you were to use this notation on this exercise, you'd be wrong, so you'd get points taken off, because what you'd be saying is that uh, I think there's just one variable. Okay. So then uh, we want to compute uh, the u partial. So uh, I'm going to do each one of them kind of uh, separately. Which one do you want me to work on first? The left one or the right one? The left one? OK, good. Uh, then uh, what, uh, what differentiation rule will we need to deal with this one? Product, Product rule, right? So the way I'm going to uh, interpret it is uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to take uh, this one to be the first factor in the product, and I'll take uh, this one to be the second factor. So doing that, uh, the product rule. Uh, so that would be partial with respect to u of the first thing multiplied by the second. And then add the first thing. <coughs> Multiply by the partial of the second. And then subtract this thing. And I'm just going to copy that since uh, I'm going to work on that uh, after. I finish all this business on the left. Any question about uh, getting to here? So that says uh, partial of the first factor, multiply the second, plus first factor, multiply by partial of second. Is it okay? All right. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So then uh, what's the partial of uh, 3u squared with respect to u? 6u. So this would be uh, 6u, and then multiply exponential 4u v squared, uh, then plus 3u squared 
multiply. Okay. Now, uh, what will we need to do to evaluate uh, just this thing between my index fingers? Yeah. So what I mean is that uh, you know just this thing that I'm looking at uh, between my index fingers there. How do we evaluate that one? The chain rule, right? The chain rule because it's just like this one in the end. Uh, I'm covering up the argument. If I was covering up a U, like it, and that was it, it was like exactly a U, then uh, you know it would just be exponential of U. But uh, because what I'm covering up is not exactly U, rather it's a function of U, that means uh, we'll need to use the chain rule. All right. So uh, I'll write that down. So exponential of 4uv squared. And now, just like uh, I wrote uh, that chain rule bit in green, I'm going to write this chain rule bit in green. Okay, so that green bit there is uh, the, chain, uh, the chain rule. So now partial with respect to you. This last thing I'm just copying, because uh, like I said, I'm going to deal with it uh, later. So now uh, here's uh, kind of like the first place where the issue has uh, come up. So all the rest of the stuff that doesn't have partials with it, like uh, that bit, it's all done. And uh, that, uh, that thing in the front, it's all done. So that, that's done. But this, for example, the green part is not done. Uh, we want to compute uh, the u partial of 4uv squared. Well, what is it? 4v squared becomes. Uh, let's consider. What if... Uh, what if I was asking you to compute the u partial of 4u? Then what would the answer be? 4, because uh, 4 is a constant. And if instead of, instead of being uh, the u partial of 4u, what if it was the u partial of 44u? 44. And if it was the u partial of pi u, it would be pi, because pi is a constant. So the only thing that matters is that uh, that thing is a constant, right? So here's the deal, is that, uh, yes, I observe that that says v squared, and v squared is uh, manifestly, well, v is manifestly a letter. Okay, I don't dispute that. But uh, it's a constant in this context. Why is v a constant? With respect to you, and v is not uh, moving. So because v is constant, so is v squared. Like, uh, is 8 constant? Yes. Is 8 squared a constant? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, 4v squared is a constant, so uh, the partial of this is just 4v uh, uh, squared. Okay. V squared, and then now finally subtract uh, the partial with respect to u of uh, u to 8 over v to 5. Okay. So uh, any question getting to here so far? All right. Uh, now, uh, I want to remind you of something, is that... Uh, Many, uh, many uh, algebraic expressions like uh, square roots and, and uh, what have you, uh, there's multiple ways to write them. And uh, one of the reasons that there's multiple ways to write them is, uh, in the first place, just like historical coincidence. But uh, another reason is that, uh, as it happens, sometimes one representation is more useful in one context, and a different representation is more useful in a different context. So here's, here's, uh, here's the deal is that uh, 
uh, <laughs> never mind. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say exactly that phrase again in about uh, four minutes. <laughs> right now, what I want you to see, <laughs> right now, what I want you to see is that uh, what if I asked you to compute the partial with respect to v, uh, I mean with respect to u? Somehow I got v in my head, so I started saying that, but we're doing u. Uh, what if I asked you to compute the partial with respect to u of u to 8, uh, and it was like divided by 4, like that? Then, uh, well, one thing I could do is that, uh, or do we agree that div dividing by 4 is the same as multiplying by a fourth? Yeah. So uh, because the derivative is homogeneous, uh, constant uh, factors can come out. So this would be this. So the fourth can uh, come out. And, uh, you know, there's nothing sacred about uh, four for this purpose. Uh, the only thing that matters is that uh, four was constant. Okay, so then, you know, if it was a uh, slightly uh, uh, weirder looking, then, uh, you know, I could have done uh, the partial with respect to u of uh, u to eight, and maybe it would be over like, uh, you know, like pi to pi cubed. Why not? That sounds great. Now, uh, pi, that's a constant. How about pi cubed? It's a constant, right? What I mean, you know, the question, you know, you can answer it like this. What if you typed pi cubed into your calculator and got a number today, and then you wrote it down, and then a week later, you did it again? <laughs> would, it, would it be the same? Yeah, it'd be the same. It's a constant. Okay. So then, uh, you know, 1 over pi cubed. partial with respect to u, u to 8, right? So now the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, the next thing I'm about to do, if I don't say this stuff in red, a lot of students like uh, choke just a little bit. So does anyone care to hypothesize? What am I going to do? Exactly. I'm going to factor out that, uh, that uh, 1 over v to 5. And that's a uh, that's a fine thing to do because uh, we're doing a u partial. So we can factor out v because v is constant. All right. Uh, so then this would be 6u exponential for u v squared and then uh, plus 3u squared exponential for u v squared uh, times 4 v squared. That's just copying all that uh, junk there. And then now subtract 1 over v to 5, multiply partial with respect to u, u to h. Okay, because uh, v is a constant, and therefore 1 over v to 5 is constant. Uh, finally, uh, what is the u partial of u to h? Eight u to seven. So this would be six u exponential four u v squared plus three u squared exponential four u v squared times four v squared. Subtract one over v to five. Multiply. 8 u to 7. Any question about this one? So now, just a brief comment is that, uh, you know, under normal circumstances, uh, you know, you probably want to work on these at the same time. You know, I kind of made it, uh, I kind of like uh, prolonged the, the, the whole bit uh, by working on just that part and copying that and then just copying that and working only on that part. But, uh, you know, feel free to do it this way. This is a nice way to do it. But uh, if you're having the sense that, uh, wow, I think I could have done that more compactly, okay, well, I don't dispute that. Uh, so that's the u partial. Uh, now I'm going to, for the same function, I'm going to ask for the v partial. So I'm going to copy that function down here. Uh, so 3 u squared 
exponential for u v squared subtract u to 8 over v to 5. And so there's that uh, function there. Uh, now, question 2.2. Uh, uh, my request is going to be, please compute um, this one. So it looks, uh, the request looks uh, visually similar to, uh, to the previous one, except uh, what's the distinction? Now we're doing it with V. Also, now that you've had some time to write uh, this exercise with U and V, I'd like to uh, point out that uh, Many times I have seen students confuse the greater and even themselves because, uh, you know, students write a V like that and a U like that. So uh, I encourage you to, uh, you know, make them look different. Uh, so if you have a glance at what you're writing and if it's not like abundantly clear which one is a U and which one is a V, then uh, it... Uh, <laughs> At least for the purposes of this class, you might consider, uh, you know, writing your U's and V's a little different. Okay, so now, uh, like I said, uh, I'm going to use uh, the other the other partial notation for this one. Uh, so instead of the 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 f uh, fancy looking D thing, I'm going to use the uh, the V uh, the the subscript thing. So. Uh, the V partial of UV. So uh, the V partial distributes, except uh, now I'm going to write it like this. 3 multiply U squared times exponential of uh, 4 U V squared like that. So on the previous page, when I was using the other notation, I wrote uh, partial, partial U. Uh, but now I want to do it with respect to V, and now just for no good reason, just to illustrate the other notation, I'm going to do it in, uh, in the other notation, and the way that you do that is with a subscript V, just like that. So that says uh, we're, going to, we're going to take that and then compute its V partial. And now uh, subtract. This and then subscript V. Okay. Any question about uh, the notation? Okay. Uh, so uh, let's consider uh, when we're doing this v partial, what uh, what is constant? U is constant, right? So and and uh, so are all of, so so are all of the threes and things like that. Those are all constant. So this uh, three u squared is uh, in fact a constant. So uh, I'm going to uh, factor it out. So that uh, this is uh, 3u squared like that, and then exponential of 4u v squared, partial with respect to v. And then uh, again, u is constant. So I'm going to factor out the u part. So this would be subtract u to 8, multiply 1 over v to 5. Uh, v partial. Any question about uh, about that? Factoring the constants out. All right. So then uh, for this one, uh, we're differentiating the exponential again. So uh, whenever you're differentiating the exponential, you always get exactly the same exponential back. So you're always going to write exactly that thing down. But uh, because the argument to the exponential, the thing I'm covering up, if it was exactly v. If I was covering up exactly a v, then uh, we just write exponential of v. But uh, if I'm covering up something that's not exactly a v, that means we have to do the chain rule, which means that uh, not only do we copy the exponential, but uh, we also copy the argument and compute his v partial. In uh, using this notation, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, the exponential of, uh, say, w, and the w partial of that. That's just the exponential of w when those two things are in agreement. 
Uh, but when those two things are not in agreement, if uh, you want to compute, say, the exponential of uh, z, with respect to w. So notice that uh, w and z are not uh, the same. They're different. Every time you compute uh, the derivative of the exponential, you'll get that same exponential back. So it always comes back. But uh, to satisfy the chain rule, now what? Uh-huh. We now have to multiply by the partial of uh, the argument. Right. So what I'm telling you is that uh, this stuff that I wrote here, just, just there, that's exactly uh, the same as uh, these notations. These are the same. Well, not, not the notations, but uh, the information is the same, just uh, written in a different way. Any question about it? Again, uh, I only am showing this because uh, this kind of information is all, this kind of notation is all over the book and uh, YouTube. I personally usually use this notation, but uh, the, the partial thing. But uh, I make uh, no requirement on you. Use either one. Okay, so then this will be 3 u squared, and then uh, using the chain rule, we get the same exponential back. Oops. And then for the chain rule, we have to multiply by 4 u v squared it's v partial so that's the chain rule there I'll just copy this term down only because I'm you know just focusing us on this part here then uh, what is the v partial of 4u v squared Eight uv. So, what if uh, you know? What if I was just asking, what's the v partial of v squared? Two v. Right. Uh, what if I was asking, what is the uh, what is the v partial of four v squared? Eight v. Right. Because it'd be well, it'd be four. That four would just hang out, and then uh, multiplied by two uh, v. So it'd be eight v. Uh, and then that u is just yet another constant. Okay. So uh, for the, you know, if if you see it uh, and it's obvious to you, great. I'm going to uh, I'm going to intersperse uh, an intermediate step for u v squared like this, and then multiply by, well, the four and the u are constants like we said, so I'll just uh, factor them out. V squared, v partial. Uh, okay, and I'll deal with that in a second. But uh, now I want to, well, I'll just copy it, doesn't matter. I'll do this. Blah. I'll give myself some room to write. All right, so that one's obvious enough, so I'll just do it. But uh, right now I want to say the following. So that thing I started to say before is that uh, there's often more than one way to write something. Part of that is just historical coincidence and, mo and momentum. Uh, you know, kind of like a, in English, we have like, uh, you know, at least two words for everything. Uh, very often three, <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, English at any rate uh, come, is a Germanic language, so it's got all that heritage. And then, uh, you know, uh, Latin influenced uh, everything in Europe, so, you know, we've got Latin words, the la words that are ultimately from Latin. And then uh, Greek also had a lot of influence, so we've got Greek words. <laughs> you know, so very often, you know, got more than one word. In math, it's no different. Uh, so 1 over v to 5 is, uh, is nice when you're doing algebra. 
So the expression one over v to five uh, is a uh, is a nice is I'll I'll write it uh, convenient convenient uh, when uh, when doing. Uh, algebra steps. You know, algebra work. Like uh, solving an equation or something like that. Uh, for calculus work, calculus uh, work, um, that is to say, you know, things like a uh, derivative integral, things like that. Uh, there's a better way to write it. What's a better way to write it? V to negative 5. So V to negative 5 is preferable. Preferable. Okay, uh, as a result, uh, I'm going to change it to be that way. So 3u squared exponential 4uv squared uh, 4u 2v uh, subtract u to 8 multiply v to negative 5 v partial. Okay. I'll copy down this first thing here. So 3 u squared exponential 4 u v squared times 4 u 2 v subtract u to 8. And then finally, <laughs> what's uh, the v partial of v to negative 5? Good. Negative 5 multiplied by v to negative 6. All right. Very nice. You know, there's various things you could do to simplify this a little bit. Uh, like, for example, you could, uh, you know, that uh, negation makes that subtraction an add. You could commute uh, the 2 and the 4 and the 3 all to the front and get a 24. You could commute this u to be over by that, that u squared to make it a u cubed. There's there's a variety of things you can do. But uh, I'm just going to leave it here. Any question about this? So uh, again, you know, you, it's definitely possible to have answered this question in a more compact way. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I just selected uh, you know, a function like this so that uh, we could talk about all these things that uh, you already knew, just to remind you of them. Any question about this? Okay, so uh, now uh, we need to, you know, now that uh, I've kind of introduced you to the idea of uh, functions with signature R2 to R, um, I want to uh, uh, take a step back and uh, look at uh, some simpler things. Now they're like uh, conceptually simpler. Uh, but uh, many students have a more difficult time with them. So I decided to do this part first because uh, this is usually easier to digest. All right, so here we go. Uh, the first remark is that uh, when you draw just the reels by themselves, uh, so like when you like draw it, Now, the way you draw it is, uh, well, you draw a line, and uh, it's got to be pointy so that you know which way is the increasing direction. And uh, it is, uh, you know, the convention when drawing is a, a single line is that uh, the increasing direction is to the right. 
So uh, what kind of things live inside of the reels? Well, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, little copies of the reels live inside of the reels. What, what I mean by that is that uh, here's a, an example. This little arrow is a thing that lives inside of the reels. Okay, so it's, uh, you know, that long. We could get out a ruler, a linear measuring device, and determine, you know, you know maybe, that, uh, maybe that has length too. All right. Uh, it has length too, but my question to you is, uh, is uh, are we going to assign it the name negative two or positive two? Positive two. Why are we going to give it, uh, why are we going to say that that's positive two? It's two, it's two, definitely two, because I said I measured it and its, two, and its length is two. But why positive two? Because, yeah, it's pointing in the same direction as the world. Okay. So you see the, the pointiness is, uh, they're, they're in agreement. Okay, so here's another member of uh, that uh, same, uh, of, of the line. Okay, so like here's one. And, uh, you know, maybe that one is, uh, you know, if that's two, then maybe that's, uh, I don't know, like uh, six, as length six. But uh, are we going to assign it, uh, are we going to assign it the value negative six or positive six? Negative six. Why? Yeah, it's going uh, in the other way. So it's like, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, what we're, what, what we're saying is that uh, there's an orientation to the line, it's that way. Just like uh, rivers have an orientation, right? Like the direction the water is flowing. So you're either going with the water or you're going uh, against it. Okay, uh, fine. Now, uh, in the case of functions that uh, have signature, you know, back in the, that, that, uh, back in the good old days, like college algebra and uh, calculus one, reels to reels, uh, how does the situation look? Well, I could say uh, let uh, let uh, f be uh, one of those, a real to real function. Uh, then uh, let's draw the graph. So the plot of the graph. y is f of x. So, in fact, I'm going to need uh, two different plots. So now, uh, what I, one of the things I want to remind you of is that uh, x and y, there's nothing special about those names. Uh, but uh, since I'm introducing a new concept, I'm going to use x and y <laughs> so that uh, we're not fighting two things at the same time. Uh, so this is the x-axis, and this is the y-axis. And uh, the thing I want to, uh, among the things I want to impress upon you, is that uh, this is the uh, input axis. You know, because uh, that's, that's where you're giving uh, inputs to the function. And this is the uh, output axis. And then for the purpose of, um, of figuring out uh, you know, what kind of creatures live in this world, you know, this, this world that we're looking at. Uh, so this is a one-dimensional world because it's a line. So that means little one-dimensional creatures live in it, like so. Uh, but uh, this is a two-dimensional uh, world, which means that uh, its denizens are uh, two-dimensional things. So we're going to want to look at them and assign them, uh, you know, we want to say that uh, just like this one is in agreement with the world, and that one is in, uh, in disagreement. We want to say the same thing about this. So uh, the way the orientation works is that uh, you, you make a swirl that uh, first follows the first axis and then follows the second axis. So if you, if you follow the first axis for a moment and then, and then follow the second axis and then swirl around, then it uh, looks like that. So this is the orientation of the of the two-dimensional plane. That's how it looks. A uh, counterclockwise swirl. So uh, there's this, uh, believe it or not, this is like all over the, 
all over the um, your, your your experience. So like uh, you know we've got the North Pole, right? The North Pole uh, of the Earth, I mean. <laughs> and uh, you know most most uh, folks, uh, you know when they look at a map. Here's a fun thing. Here's a fun thing. Uh, is that uh, take a map. Uh, if someone has a map hung on the wall, and then just like turn it upside down, and and uh, you know, ask them to like uh, point to where any obvious country is, like uh, or 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 landmark, like uh, where's Florida? You know, that's pretty notable. But uh, if you turn the map upside down, a lot of people look at the map, they can't even find something obvious like Florida. And it gets even worse for more obscure things. Uh, so you know, we have got this like strong convention of like what the North Pole is. Well, the way that you could tell, like uh, if some, if some uh, catastrophe happened to the Earth, uh, or if you were just gone for hundreds of millions of years and then you came back, and you weren't really sure which pole was the North Pole, you know, because you flew away and then you came back, uh, the, the North Pole is the one that when you're looking down on it from above, it's the, it's the pole where the Earth is swirling that way. So the idea is, the, 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 the reason for this convention is that, uh, well, have a look. If I uh, put my thumb up, pointed up, you know, toward the camera, out of the page, then uh, notice the direction that my fingers curl. They're in agreement with that. Uh, that's uh, as opposed to my uh, left hand. My left hand disagrees. So uh, this convention is referred to as the right hand rule. Okay. So that's what uh, positive orientation looks like in, in this uh, world. Now, if we draw a, uh, a function, and if I say, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, for example, uh, it's uh, between A and B, then the two main notions uh, that from calculus are, well, in the first place, uh, if we integrate, if we integrate uh, this region, then uh, what we get is the signed area here. And uh, the, the signed, uh, what, what, you know, breaking this into sort of two logical pieces, what would be the sign of this area? It would be positive, and the sign of that one, negative. Okay? So in the end, the reason is because, uh, well, if you were to take a little bitty uh, one of these, whose orientation is in agreement with, the, with that one, and then from here, uh, where do you go? Do you go up or down? You go up. You know, to that one. And then uh, that uh, cuts out a little bitty uh, rectangle that has a positive orientation. Orientation that's uh, in agreement with the world. So as a result, that's, that, uh, that area is reckoned positive. Similarly, you know, from here, if you take a little, little uh, one of these, and then from here, uh, to get to the, you know, from the, from the pointy place, uh, to get to the function, you go down. And uh, that makes a little uh, rectangle. And uh, again, the rule is that uh, first you follow the first, uh, the first axis, then you follow the second. So now it's uh, the opposite. So that uh, part is negative. All right. Now, uh, that's like from the, from the integral point of view. From the, uh, pardon me, from the differential point of view, if that's the function, then uh, if we consider this uh, particular input here, so that's uh, a particular input, uh, this is the output, and then uh, at that uh, place right there, because this function is uh, smooth, uh, that means that uh, the best local flat approximation uh, here is a line, and the name for that is called a, a tangent line. And it uh, looks 
more or less like that. So that blue is the local flat approximation. Uh, what that means, the way to interpret that, is that uh, if you were living on the red world, if you were living on it, and uh, you were a little bitty, and uh, you were right there, then uh, some you know, very powerful entity could like, replace the red world with the blue world, and uh, you wouldn't know as long as you stayed, as long as you stayed close. Because the red, it, you're so small, the red looks flat to you, as flat as that blue thing. OK, uh, now. Uh, this particular line, is it sloping uh, negatively, zero, or positively? It's sloping positively. Okay. Uh, as a result, uh, near, this, uh, near this point, the function is increasing. Okay. It's going up. Okay. Uh, the reason for the name increase, the reason for that uh, is the following, is that uh, if from here, because uh, this is the input, if you take a little positive thing, a little positive thing, and from here, uh, and you, you, you move along the world, do you see that you'll go up? So what I mean is that uh, what, what this is saying is that a small positive increase in the input direction is going to result in a small positive increase in the output direction. So, you know, yes, you know, you, you move to the right, and that's in agreement with this one, that causes you to move up in agreement with this one. That's what it means to be increasing. Uh, whereas, uh, for example, right here, the function still has a, uh, a tangent there, a local flat approximation. So it's still, it's still got one, but uh, um, now, does this uh, tangent line, does it have a negative slope, zero slope, or positive slope? Negative slope. Now the reason why that's called negative slope is because if from this input you increment positively in the input direction, that's going to result in, a, in an increment in the negative output direction. So when you, when you increase the input, the output decreases. As a result, this is called uh, decreasing. Good. Any question about this? Now, finally, uh, here's the thing that I want to get to, uh, across to you, hopefully, and that is, uh, all right. Uh, are we in agreement that uh, a line is a one-dimensional thing? It's a one-dimensional thing because, uh, you know, if you were here, or, you know, let's ignore what I drew on there. If you were right, to, if you were right there and uh, you, you could move around, but you had to stay on the graphite, can we agree that uh, you can only, there's only one direction to travel? You either travel, you know, that way or that way, but you can't go that way. As a result, this is a one-dimensional thing. So what, I'm, uh, what I want you to see is that uh, these red graphs, these red worlds, they're one-dimensional. They're just one-dimensional things. If you were a little bitty creature uh, right there on the red world, then it would look flat to you, and you'd only have the choice of moving uh, more or less forward or back. That's all you have. So it's one-dimensional. And you can see that because the tangent surface, uh, the tangent uh, object is a line. So now, uh, now that uh, we've reviewed uh, those uh, things that you already knew, here we are with functions of this signature. Now, the red is a one-dimensional uh, world. The math name, just for those of you that like to know the math name, the, the name for this uh, red, red thing, is, it's called a, a one-dimensional manifold. But uh, you know, that's not important for our class. Now, the thing is, is that we had to draw it on a two-dimensional setting. Because uh, there's two objects, there's a single real input and there's a single real output. So that means there's two things, which means to make a which me means to make a sensible drawing, we need a two-dimensional uh, plane to draw on. Now there's three objects here uh, because there's two inputs and one output. So there's three things. 
as a result, uh, to make sensible drawings of these things, we're going to make we're going to need to make three-dimensional drawings. <laughs> I promise I'll do my best <laughs> uh, because you know it's two plus one. We got to make three-dimensional drawings. But uh, fundamentally, these are going to be two-dimensional things. So uh, now, uh, an, ex an example is like uh, you know this sheet of paper here. It's uh, you know it exists in a three-dimensional world. And in fact, if you got a microscope and you looked at it really close, it's, it's really a three-dimensional thing, right? You can see like atoms and stuff. But if we just pretend uh, that that's not the case and that this is infinitely thin, then this is a two-dimensional object, right? And uh, you know, I'm doing this neat uh, or not <laughs> rippling thing. And uh, you can't really make sense of the rippling unless you're looking at it in a three-dimensional space, right? Even though this is a two-dimensional thing, all right. Here we go. So when we draw these axes, there's going to be three of them. So it starts out, uh, you know, pretty good. Okay. Nobody's, uh, you know, like uh, nobody's hurt yet, you know, <laughs> doing this. And then to draw the three one, the the third one, uh, you just take it and you just kind of do this. So. Uh, specifically, what I'm saying here is that, uh, well, this axis is an input axis. Uh, and as far as the drawing is concerned, it's coming out of the page. Of the page. Okay, this is another input axis. Uh, it is uh, in the plane of the page. And uh, this is the output axis. Uh, and it's also in the plane of the page. All right, so now, uh, suppose that uh, we have a, a function. Let uh, z be equal to f of x and y. Okay, so then that is to say there, there's two inputs. We're naming them x and y, and uh, there's a single output, and we're naming it z. Now, uh, just like uh, there's, a, there's hard conventions about how we draw these ones, the hard convention being that uh, we're always going to do it uh, basically so that uh, it agrees, if you hold your thumb coming out of the page, the orientation agrees with your right hand. Uh, there's, sim there's similar conventions here. So now, in this case, the output, the name of the output was Y. And, uh, but at any rate, what I want you to see is that the output axis was the vertical one. We're going to do the same thing here. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make uh, the vertical one be the output axis. So what's gonna be its name? It's a uh, it's the z axis, right? Z, because uh, the the uh, output is z. So this is z. All right, which means that uh, these uh, these must be the x and y axes. And then there's a question about. Uh, that you, you've got to be clear about is uh, which one is which? All right. So here's the thing. You know, you might say, uh, you know, uh, when we're doing x's and y's, that one's always the x-axis. You know that one? Uh, so, you know, it might seem, uh, you, know, you might say, okay, well, what if, uh, what if we uh, do that? Actually, that won't work. That one can't be the x. It has to, x has to be this one. Okay, so now we need to talk about uh, the reason for that. This one has to be x, and uh, therefore, by process of elimination, this one is y. All right. So uh, let's consider for a moment. Why this and uh, not some other way? In the end, it has to do with a, a convention about the, way things, uh, about the way things are. So if we, uh, if we uh, uh, just 
ignore the y, the z axis for a moment, and uh, just look at that. You know, to where it, that's that's like someone took our our beloved x y axis, and then uh, you know instead of leaving it flat in the page, they like uh, you know gave it a twist, so it's like coming out of the page a little bit. It's a little inconvenient to look at, but uh, it's the same thing that we're used to. Now, what is the uh, the orientation of of just this plane? If, if it's going to have the same as this one, well, we'd have to follow we'd have to follow x first and then y, right? So its orientation uh, would uh, be this, just just this plane, okay, counterclockwise. Now. The re this uh, is an explanation of why it needs to be this way. Because, uh, have a look. If we consider, again, with the globe and taking this to be the North Pole, uh, if, that, if that way is north, okay, like, like that, unfortunately I made the arrow. If that way is north, then can you see that uh, that is in agreement with my hand? The, the curl of my fingers. So, uh, so that's... Uh, that's uh, why it needs to be this way and not uh, not the other way. All right. So now, uh, when uh, in this world, in the one-dimensional world, there's little one-dimensional creatures, and they're either in agreement with the orientation of the world, or they're not. And then uh, in the two-dimensional world, uh, the you know the citizens are these little rectangles, and they're either in agreement with the orientation of the world, or they're not. Uh, in the three-dimensional world, the creatures that uh, that are that are in there, what are they? They're not uh, they're not uh, one-dimensional things. They're not uh, two-dimensional things. What are they? Well, they're little three-dimensional things. All right, let's have a look. So, what I want you to consider is that uh, this is a rectangle, <coughs> and. Uh, I'm going to like say something that's a little weird. I'm going to say that this is a two-dimensional rectangle. Uh, this is a, well, it's a one-dimensional rectangle. And uh, here we want a three-dimensional rectangle. So suppose that uh, we have a, uh, a three-dimensional rectangle, which is just a fancy name for a box. So you start out by uh, drawing a little line segment that's parallel to that one, okay, then another one that's parallel to it, and then two line segments that are parallel to that one. Now you go straight up, make a nice little uh, box there. All right. So now we want to know. Uh, what uh, boxes? You know, we could get out. Uh, we could get out uh, the ruler, and we could measure the base times the width times the height, and we could find their volume. But then uh, the question would remain. Uh, <laughs> the question would remain: uh, Shall we assign it a, a positive value or a negative value? All right. So here's the deal. Uh, the way you do it is uh, you check. Is uh, you know what if uh, what if it uh, is the case that uh, the base of this uh, has, uh, uh, has positive orientation. If it has positive orientation, like this, the base has positive orientation, and then uh, we take that, and then from there we go up, then uh, this is going to be a, po a, a cube with positive volume. What that means is that uh, be the fact that the base has positive orientation in agreement with, uh, with that, and uh, the height has positive orientation. That means that everything has positive orientation. So uh, the result is uh, positive. So what I'm telling you is that uh, this, just like uh, that is the symbol for positive and negative in the one-dimensional world, that is the symbol for positive and negative in the two-dimensional world. In uh, the three-dimensional world, the symbol for positive is This, uh, 
because that's in agreement with your right hand. Thumb with the thing. And uh, fingers going around it. You could grab it, if you can imagine. And then uh, if, uh, instead of that, <clears throat> we have a box. And uh, if the base, instead of having a, instead of the base having a positive orientation, if the base has a negative orientation, so the base uh, has a clockwise orientation, so that's the negative orientation for a base. And then uh, from there we go up. Then this uh, box has a volume, and its volume is negative. And uh, that is the symbol for, uh, for negative. Uh, because, uh, you know, it's in disagreement with your right hand. So if your thumb is going in the same uh, direction as that one, then that's the opposite sense of your, of your fingers in, with your right hand. But uh, notice that it's in agreement with your left hand. Your fingers are, are doing it, if you can see it. So uh, that's the convention for positive and negative. So here's, uh, you know, some interesting things that uh, you might uh, want to just uh, think about. And that is that... Uh, um, I uh, like the word uh, ambidextrous, which is a nice word for, for a lot of reasons. So in the first place, uh, ambi is a, uh, is a Greek prefix. Uh, and then dextrous is a, <laughs> is a Latin noun. So that's like an admixture there <laughs> of things. And, uh, you know, ambidextrous is the name that uh, you give to people who can equally well use both of their hands. But uh, literally... Uh, uh, ambi means both, and dexter means right. So, like, literally, ambidextrous is, uh, means that you have two right hands. That's, that's its meaning. <laughs> and then, uh, well, uh, left-handed, <laughs> left the word for left-handed is sinister. <laughs> you know, as in evil. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fact that uh, historically, you know, not, not now really so much, but, uh, you know, historically, left-handed people were... Uh, were discriminated against. It's not. A, I'm not. Uh, I'm not joking. It's like a fact. Uh, even even I in uh, in uh, in uh, kindergarten, I was subject to this in this modern day. Uh, I do everything in the world with my left hand except write, because my kindergartner kindergarten teacher refused to to you know allow that. Uh, fine. So. Uh, so we've got uh, this idea. Now, uh, I want you to imagine the following. Imagine that uh, you're looking at uh, a mirror, you know, like a big, a big mirror, like in the bathroom or something like that. And uh, imagine uh, that you're holding up your right hand and looking at the person in the mirror. What, uh, what hand are they holding up? Their left hand, right? Correct? Because, uh, you know, in your mind's eye, imagine it. You're holding up your right hand, looking in the mirror. The person in the mirror is holding up their left hand. Okay? So now, here's, the, here's what I want you to observe. Is that uh, if this, uh, if this uh, green thing that I'm drawing here is a mirror, if that's a mirror, then, uh, and that's, the notation for positive in a three-dimensional space, then uh, what, what will this see when it's looking in the mirror? It'll see that one. So what I'm telling you is that uh, like the convention of right and left, right hand and left hand, uh, if you look in a mirror, the reflection of your right hand is your left hand. Uh, similarly, it's the same kind of thing going here. This is just like the abstract mathematicalness of it is that uh, when you reflect a positive thing across the mirror, you get a negative thing, and uh, vice versa. Okay, good. 
uh, this, uh, this goes on and on. Uh, so an example, you know, just to, just to I want to impress, impress upon you the importance of this idea because it's like all over the place. So for those of you that uh, want to be like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, in, in medicine or something like that, if that's what uh, your school uh, is about for you, then uh, here's an interesting uh, thing you have to do. Is that, uh, <coughs> just a minute, I'm assembling this. I meant to assemble it before I got here. But I guess that didn't happen. So carbon, uh, for those of you that are going to be, uh, you know, that want to go to medical school or what have you, uh, you've eventually got to take uh, organic chemistry. And a big part of, of organic chemistry is, uh, is coming to, to terms, more or less, with this, with this uh, exact thing right here. So uh, carbon is interesting uh, uh, in organic chemistry. And the main reason is that, uh, you know, this is a carbon uh, atom, representative of a carbon, carbon atom. The reason why it's interesting is because it's possible for carbon to make uh, four covalent bonds, uh, and they're relatively stable. So what that means is that uh, carbon can bond to uh, four different things, right? One, two, three, four. And uh, here's, the th here's the deal, is that uh, in organic chemistry, one of the big things you have to do is you, you look at a carbon, in the first place, you have to figure out, uh, does that carbon have an orientation, or does it not? Uh, and if it does have an orientation, does it have a left-handed orientation or a right-handed orientation? Except they're not calling, calling it that. They usually call it a, 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 uh, uh, an S or an R for, uh, for rectus and sinister, meaning right and, right and left. So here's uh, two, two things. And uh, these, these molecules are reflections of each other. You know, if there was a mirror right here, that's what uh, the other one would see. And uh, what, that, what that means is that uh, it's not possible to put these side by side and uh, make it to where they fit on top of each other. So like uh, you can't, you can't uh, rotate this so that uh, everything lines up perfectly. You know, you can get them to reflect, but uh, they can't uh, line up. So fundamentally, you know, one of them is like the left version and the other is the right version. They would see each other in the mirror. But uh, you know, if you change this, uh, this one to white and that one to white, then uh, the, it, it ceases to be uh, an oriented molecule at that point. So now, uh, that's a big thing in, uh, in chemistry. So here's, a, here's an interesting thing like in real life. You might have heard of mad cow disease. You know that one? It's really super dangerous. Uh, you know, and uh, that's what it's called when, when, uh, when, uh, when cattle have it. When uh, humans have it, uh, we call it Creutzfeldt-Jakob uh, disease. Because, uh, you know, humans are special, I guess. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, what it is, is uh, all, all that it is, all, is that uh, besides a, like, a, a sure death sentence, is that uh, you know, your, 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 uh, your body makes a, uh, a left-handed version of a protein that's useful to you, useful to the way that your brain works. And uh, every once in a while, in fact quite often, uh, instead of making a left-handed one, sometimes inadvertently a right-handed one is made. But uh, usually your body just detects that and either fixes it, fixes that molecule, or just, or just metabolizes it and destroys it. So it's like not a problem. But uh, every once in a while something slips through cracks. And all that uh, creutzfeldt jakobs disease is, is that uh, your body needs this one. Uh, it's useful to the way that your brain works. But uh, if ever you eat a hamburger that uh, has come from, a, from, from a, a, a cow that had mad cow, is that uh, you ingest one of the left-handed, one of the right-handed ones. Or I don't know if I have it correct. It might, I might have it reversed, but anyway, it doesn't matter uh, for the purpose of discussion. So this is the one you need, and then you eat one of these, and what happens is, is that uh, when, uh, when this one bumps into that one, uh, it turns it into one of these. So it, uh, essentially, when they hit each other, uh, instead of having a right and a left, now you have two rights. And then each of them go off, and they find the left version ones, and they hit those, and now you have more rights. And then they hit and hit and hit, and it's, uh, it's uh, quite rapid. And uh, the thing is, is that uh, under normal circumstances, your body would just notice that this is just garbage, and just metabolize it and get it out of you, but it doesn't. 
So what ends up happening is that uh, you have a progressive brain disease. You just die because uh, your brain gets full of garbage that your body's not metabolizing. And uh, moreover, you can't use the protein that you need because it's being consumed so rapidly by the other one. It's a really uh, pretty sad situation. Uh, I hope we figure it out. Uh, to be a little happier, though, uh, you know, uh, the way that you smell, like your sense of smell, is uh, what it is is that uh, in your nose you have little uh, chemical receptors, and all that smell is is it's uh, it, it's it's uh, those chemical receptors are measuring how well or how not well uh, the little molecules uh, fit in your in in the chemical receptors. So like uh, you know smell is like uh, this molecule fits or it doesn't, and then you get a signal to your brain, and then you think oh it smells. So if in your in your mind if you can uh, imagine what uh, lemon smell like. Okay, just a regular old lemon. Uh, the name for the molecule that gives lemon, uh, lemon its scent is uh, limonene. But uh, limonene is in fact a, a chiral molecule, which means it has a left-handed and a right-handed version. And uh, that means that uh, if you take limonene and you reflect it, you get a different molecule, and uh, it's actually another scent. Do you know what scent it is? <laughs> That's a good guess. It's not lime. It's actually pine. It's pine. Uh, so what I'm telling you is that, you know, it's kind of like a funny joke. You know, you can take like a, like a bottle of, you know, like a, of a, you know, uh, like a pine saw, you know, the cleaning stuff. And if you're like an organic chemist and you like uh, are looking at yourself holding the pine saw in the mirror, it's, a, it's actually lemon saw. <laughs> <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> Good. All right. Any question about this? Yes? So, okay, so uh, for the orientation thing, mm -hmm. so we're associating it with plus and minus, but usually plus and minus would be like, so minus would be if you move it to the other side of the axis, but this is like if you flip it over. Is the orientation thing? Uh, I'm just talking about if you took a bite of three dimensional space. And you like uh, just like grabbed it and just like took it over here and just looked at it. Right. What I'm saying is that uh, if it fits this pattern, it's uh, positive. If, if it's that pattern, it's negative. That's all that I'm saying. Okay. I'm not sure. I guess I don't follow the question. Right, yeah, I'm not talking, it doesn't matter where it's located. Like, I could take this, I, I could take this thing over to the, like, to, to Antarctica, and it would, it would still look like this, and that would still be uh, the negative orientation. Or I could take it over to, like, another galaxy, that'd be fine, too. Yeah, so, this is just, like, some inherent property in the box? Or right. Okay. What I'm saying is that, uh, you know, it's easier to see in the one-dimensional case. Uh, this this one-dimensional thing, it's got an inherent direction, it's that way, right? Not some other way, it's that way. <laughs> what I'm saying is that uh, this three-dimensional space has an inherent uh, direction to it, right. and that's it. But the, so for the number line, like, direction is like, sort of a, like, I guess there's one thing where it's like, it's pointing in a direction, but we know it's that direction because mm -hmm. it's in relative to zero, right? It doesn't, no, I mean, I, I purposefully did not draw zero. This could be anywhere. Zero could be, you know, I'll, I'll, put the, I'll put a zero here for you. This is zero. Yeah. This is still positive yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's pointing in the, that direction. Yeah. It doesn't matter where it's located. Good. Uh, fine. So there's a definite uh, sense to, to, uh, to this. Good. And it's funny, like if you ever take, if you ever take a, uh, an organic chemistry exam, or if you like just walk in on one, you know, maybe your buddies are in there or something. Uh, I guarantee what you'll, <laughs> you'll see like some, 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 you know, half of all the people are gonna be going, you know, like this trying to figure out, you know, is this molecule, is this molecule right-handed or not? <laughs> okay. Uh, I lost track, oh yeah. So uh, here we go. So these are flat things. So in the in the real-to-real -real case, uh, 
uh, in, in that one. So this is just uh, reminding you of, of uh, everything uh, of stuff that you already know. Uh, the flat objects. are, well, they're lines. That's what we call them. And then uh, every line can be expressed as AX plus BY is C. And uh, the requirement is that uh, <coughs> A and B are not both zero. So that means that uh, it means that it's permissible for one of them to be zero, but not the other. Uh, so there are three cases. cases. So the first case we'll consider is the case when A is 0. So if A, if A is 0, what, is that, what does that also imply? If A is 0. That means B isn't, right? Because the rule is that uh, they can't both be 0. So understand that uh, A, A equals 0 means B isn't. OK. Uh, in that case, if we take this equation uh, and we set a to equal zero, that means that that term goes away so that uh, we'd have zero plus by is c. And then, uh, you know, ignoring that zero there, we can divide by b because b is not zero, and we can obtain y is c over b. And uh, what I want you to uh, take away from this is that uh, that's just a constant. Uh, so an example of this would be something like, e.g., uh, you know, y is equal to uh, negative 2. So if we plot this, then, uh, you know, if we plot y is negative 2, like that specific case, then what does the plot of y equal negative 2 look like? Well, it'd be a horizontal line, right? At height uh, negative 2. So it would be uh, like this. <clears throat> OK, beautiful. Here's uh, the next case. Uh, we'll consider the case b is equal to 0. Now, what does that imply? If b is 0, then? A can't be 0. So as a result, uh, this would look like uh, A times X. And then we, we zeroed out that term. And then that's equal to C. So then uh, ignoring that 0 there, we could solve for X and get uh, that X is uh, C over A. <coughs> and uh, again, that's a constant. Uh, and uh, such an example. You know, something like, uh, you know, we might be talking about like x is 3 or something. So what does, uh, what does the line x equal to 3 look like? It's a vertical line. It would be like this one. <clears throat> so what I'm telling you is that, uh, you know, we've got this case. We call this the horizontal case. This is the vertical case. And then uh, the last uh, possibility the last possibility is well, we consider the possibility when that one is zero, we consider the possibility when that one is zero, and then uh, the only other possibility is that neither one is zero. So now uh, neither is zero. I before E. Is that right? No. 
Yeah. Man, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. You know, it's like a. Yeah, I rely on like a, you know the machine to tell me. You know, like when I type it, it just fixes it. <laughs> okay, so uh, if neither is zero, if neither one is zero, then uh, that means that uh, we that uh, we can find the intercepts. So, uh, you know, there's an x-intercept. What is the uh, algebraic condition for an x-intercept? x-intercept is when what? When y is 0. So that means uh, we take that equation, uh, and we have uh, ax. Uh, you know, y is 0, so then uh, that's zeroed out, and then that's equal to c, and uh, that tells us that uh, x is uh, what? c over a? So that's the, uh, the x-intercept, the x-coordinate of the x-intercept. And uh, then we can find the y-intercept. So what's the, what is the, con the algebraic condition for a y-intercept? Well, when x is 0, yeah. So that means the equation becomes, uh, you know, 0 plus by uh, is c, uh, so that uh, y is c over b. Uh, and therefore, now we can make a drawing that looks like this. So specifically, because, uh, because we found the x-intercept and the y-intercept, that gives us uh, two points. So, you know, maybe it's like, uh, maybe that's the y-intercept and that's the x-intercept. Those two right there. And then now that we have two points and it's a line, the only thing that we need to do is just draw the line now, right? So it's like this. You know, this is the sloped case. So what I'm telling you is that uh, all lines can be expressed in this way. AX plus BY is C. And uh, it must be the case that uh, uh, at most one of A and B is zero. Uh, then uh, we break it into three uh, possibilities, horizontal, vertical, and slope. All right. This is all stuff that you knew. But uh, I say this because now it uh, makes it easier for me to uh, say this kind of thing. So now we want uh, R squared to R. Uh, in this case, uh, flat objects are what? So they're not lines. What are they? The two-dimensional two -dimensional flat things. <laughs> they're planes. All right. So, uh, well, generally speaking, you know, if you were to like, uh, you know, uh, decide, uh, uh, you know what, I'm going to be a math major, you know, <laughs> a math instructor could dream, uh, then uh, you'd go on and uh, you'd go on and then uh, all these things you'd stop, you know, except when you're teaching, uh, you stop calling them lines and planes and they all just become flats. And you just call this a one-dimensional flat and this is a two-dimensional flat. And when, when, uh, when the situation deems it necessary, you can talk about 27-dimensional flat. Yeah, they're just flat things. Uh, so every plane can be expressed as Okay, so then just like uh, every line can be expressed by an equation like this, uh, now we want uh, an equation for every plane. And the equation for every plane is uh, visually quite similar. It's uh, AX plus BY plus CZ is equal to D. 
So you can see it's basically the same thing, but instead of having just x and y, this one has x, y, and z. Uh, but uh, we need, uh, we need a, a condition like this one. The condition here was uh, they're not both 0. The condition here is that uh, is uh, really the same thing, except uh, the language, uh, the English language, you know, it sounds more natural to say it like this, is that uh, A, B, and C are not all 0. What that means is that uh, it's permissible for one of them to be zero. It's permissible for two of them to be zero. But uh, it is not OK for all three of them to be zero. OK. So now, just like uh, we talked about lines and we said, you know, there's this kind, that kind, and that kind. We're going to do exactly that classification, except there's more kinds. And the pictures are a little more uh, adventurous, because you've got to draw three-dimensional ones of it. But uh, we can do it. Uh, but I can't do it in this, uh, you know, this uh, two and a half inches here, so I'm going to do it on the next page. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we're going to consider some, some, some cases. So 2.1. Uh, we're going to choose uh, all cases uh, when 2 of A, B, and C are 0. So what I mean by that is that uh, we're going to say those two are 0, and then we're going to say those two are the 0, and then et cetera. So the first case is uh, I'm going to choose uh, is uh, when A is 0 and B is 0. OK, and to, and to remind you, uh, the equation was, uh, I'm writing it up here on the date line, AX plus uh, BY plus CZ is D. OK, so if A and B are both 0, then uh, what does the equation become? CZ equal D. Uh, then we could, because, uh, because these are both 0, that means that C certainly is not, which means you can divide by C. So then uh, you get uh, Z is D divided by C. And uh, in particular, that's just a constant. Uh, so such an example would be, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, Z is equal to uh, 6. So the question is, is uh, OK, here's, a, here's a, the equation of a plane. The question is, is, what does that look like? All right. Well, let's start out by drawing a, a nice axis here. So z is going to be up. And then uh, now, can you remind me which one is x and which one's y? Yeah, x is coming out of the page, and y is uh, going that way within the page. All right. So now what, uh, what uh, we want to understand is uh, what does z equal to 6 look like? So in the first place, if I was to just uh, mark out, like, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so I just uh, marked out 6 there. Then uh, this point on the z-axis surely has to be part of it. Okay, that, uh, that, that one on the z-axis there that's at height 6. So now, uh, you know, my, 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 uh, my height, like, you know, in real life, is like uh, 5 foot 11 and like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like 15 sixteenths, <laughs> you know, just, just shy of 6 feet. Uh, but, you know, with shoes on, uh, okay, 6 feet. So, so like, uh, here I am. Uh, and uh, this point in, in this room, uh, this point is at six feet. So like the point I'm pointing at. Is this the only point in the room that's at six feet? No, right? Because if I just uh, you know, go over here, this is at six feet also. And uh, so this one. So what I'm telling you is that uh, the set of all points that are at height six feet, it's a plane. You know, and this is kind of a fancy room. The ceiling is not uh, flat. But in most rooms where you go in, the ceiling is just, uh, you know, like at, at eight feet. That's a plane. 
with that high PP. So what I'm telling you is that Z equal to six, this is like a, it's like a ceiling that's at height six. So now what we want to do is we want to draw something that uh, conveys that. Okay, so now uh, we're just looking at a part of the three-dimensional space. Uh, you know, we're like, a, like a, that's the ZY plane, and we're sort of imagining that we can't really see stuff that's on the other side of it. And uh, that's the XZ plane, and we're going to, you know, pretend that uh, you can't see anything over there. So we're like kind of looking down in the corner of a room down there. Uh, so, to make uh, sense of this, uh, that means that uh, all of these points would also be at height 6, right? So all of those would be. So from that point, you follow the y-axis. All of those points are at height 6. Uh, but if it, uh, if it works for y, then it also works for x, right? So from this point, now follow the x-axis. What you have to do is you need to draw a line that's parallel to that line. Now, I find, in my experience, for the purposes of drawing, the easiest way to do that is to make the line point uh, directly at me. <laughs> so I'll just turn the page. Okay. So, uh, like that. And uh, now, to, uh, you know, to make it uh, keep working, now, I'm just going to draw a part of the plane, uh, you know, because we can only see so much of it. So I'm just going to draw a part of it. You know, something like this. So like, uh, you know, that's uh, like a part of a plane. It's at height uh, six. Okay, any question about that one? Okay, so now that we did that one kind of slowly, now we'll do the other two kind of quickly. So now uh, I chose uh, A and B are zero. Now, which two do you want to be zero? Alternatively, you can think of it like, uh, which one do you want to be not zero? So which one are we going to do? C and A? OK. So then uh, A is zero, and C is zero. That means that uh, the resulting equation is uh, BY is D. Uh, and therefore, y is uh, d over b. Uh, and again, that's just a constant. Uh, and you know, to give ourselves something definite to draw and look at, you know, I'll consider like uh, say y is equal to two. Now, if this were the good old days in college algebra, uh, or you know, calculus one and uh, someone asks you to draw y equal to 2, what would it be? It would be a horizontal line, right? That's if, we were, if, that's if the world was a plane. Uh, but uh, the, in, in this context, the world is uh, you know, this uh, space here. So now the question is, what does it look like? All right. Again, z, x. Oops, I even said x. And then somehow I wrote y. Okay, so if we mark it out and say, okay, well, there's one, two. All right, so uh, this point, that point is uh, definitely part of it. Now, uh, we want to know when y is 2. So now here's a nice little trick. If I, uh, you know, just momentarily, just uh, say, like, delete the z-axis, and uh, we consider this problem like this, where it's, uh, you know, it's really a college algebra problem, and some, somehow, you know, we drew our very nice axis, uh, x, y axis, and then some vandal came by and, you know, like, twisted it on us. Well, we're still looking at it. Uh, can you see that uh, the horizontal line would look like that? Okay. So what I'm saying is that uh, from here, we need to draw a line, and uh, we need to follow the x axis. But uh, here's the thing, is that uh, because it's, uh, y is the same for all of that, that means that uh, if we needed to follow the x, what else do we need to do? We need to follow z, right? So we follow z.
All right, and then now I'm just going to make a little uh, piece, you know, like I did here. So from here, follow X a little bit, and then from here, follow Z, and uh, you know, that's the a drawing of the plane Y is two. So that's what it uh, looks like. You know, obviously it extends, you know infinitely far out this way and up there and but you can only draw part of it good uh, so the last uh, one we said uh, we said uh, this one means C is a uh, not zero this one is B is not zero so the last one is uh, a is not zero uh, so that means that uh, we're selecting B is zero and uh, C is zero so the resulting equation is a, uh, uh, ax is d, uh, so that x is uh, d over a. Uh, and again, that's just a constant. Uh, so to give ourselves something definite to look at, you know, we might consider something like, uh, you know, x is uh, 3. And, uh, you know, if, if it were back in the good old times, in uh, college algebra, if someone asked you to plot what does x equal to 3 look like, that would be a vertical line. Okay, but uh, we've, we've moved on past those good old days, and here we are in uh, these troubled times. x, y, z. And uh, we want to draw the plane um, x equal to 3. So let's mark out 1. Two, three. So, you know, this point right here, that's definitely part of it, because that's where x is 3. And then, you know, again, if you like, I could say, uh, well, you know, there's, a, there's our good old uh, vandalized uh, college algebra plane. And uh, if we wanted to draw the line x equal to 3, it'd just be a vertical line. So you can see it'd be going that way. So from there, you follow y. But again, there's nothing sacred about y, so if we, if we followed y, we're also going to need to follow z, like so. And, uh, you know. So that's a, a drawing of a piece of the plane x equal to 2. So uh, these are the like uh, analogs to horizontal and vertical. Uh, but there's three of them in the three-dimensional case instead of just two of them. All right, good. Any question about these? All right, now even more fun. So uh, the first case we consider is when two of them are zero and the other one is not. So now we're going to, uh, we're going to consider the case uh, when one. of A, B, and C is zero, uh, is zero. Uh, and the other's non-zero. Other's non-zero. Again, there's three cases. So uh, let's... Uh, uh, to make, to make our, our lives as conceptually as simple as possible, I'm going to do the first one and select C is 0. Because I think uh, you'll be able to accept that one easiest. So what is the, what is, uh, the resulting equation if C is 0? Mm -hmm. So it would be uh, AX plus BY is D. Now, here's the thing. Uh, A and B are both non-zero. Uh, what I want you to observe is that, uh, you know, if, if we were to, you know, transport ourselves back to the good old days in college algebra, then uh, that would mean that this is a, uh, a sloped line in the xy plane. That's what that would mean. So this uh, is a, a sloped line. in the 
xy plane. Uh, it's, it's a sloped line because we're saying that a and b are both not zero. Now, because it's a sloped line, that means that, uh, it's, it, uh, that we can find the, uh, the intercepts, the x and y intercepts. Uh, so uh, the x-intercept, uh, remember, that's when y is zero. Uh, so taking that equation with y is zero, uh, we get uh, ax is d and therefore uh, x is d over a. And uh, the y-intercept, that's when x is 0. So uh, that's telling us that uh, by is d, and therefore that uh, y is d over b. So. Uh, now, z, x, y. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, these intercepts. You know, that's the, that's the x-intercept and that's the y-intercept. And I'm going to plot them. You know, so uh, in particular, I'm going to like do the same kind of trick as before and say, oh yeah, this is a, a college algebra problem where someone took our perfectly, you know, reasonable x-y axis and then they, you know, twisted it. Uh, but I can still I can still work with that. Let's say that uh, this is the y-intercept, and that's the x-intercept. Okay, if that uh, you know, if it turned out that that was the case. Uh, then the line would just be the line connecting those two points, right? And uh, if this were a college algebra problem, we'd be done. But uh, it's not, so we're not. Uh, as a result, uh, you know, this is just, uh, this is the line that happens to be uh, at height uh, z equal to zero, the one that happens to be here. But uh, there's got to be another version of this line that's at height uh, z is 1, another one that's at height z is 2, 3, every number in between. So what I mean is that uh, from this point here, from this intercept, we need to follow the z-axis. And uh, from this point here, we need to follow the z-axis. And uh, the plane, at least the part of it that we can see, it's uh, like that. You know, you can kind of imagine it, uh, well, at any rate, I kind of imagine it, uh, you know, that we're in a room, you know, like you've seen those shows, you know, like, uh, what's it called, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, Chip and, uh, Chip and Joe, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, you know, they're always like remodeling or whatever, Ch Chip and Joanna Gaines, that's who they are, and, uh, you know, this is like, a, you know, I'm going to put a drop-in ceiling and blah, blah, you know, we're going to put a new, uh, you know, uh, closet, you know, so I got to put a wall there, or there, you know, like that. And uh, this one is like, you know, some fancy diagonal wall. That's what that one is. Okay. All right. So then, uh, the next case. It doesn't matter now that we've done the first case. I think you'll understand the other two. Uh, in the first case, we did C is zero and the others aren't. Now, which one do you want to be zero? Okay. B is zero. Uh, so that would mean uh, that the resulting equation is AX plus CZ is D. Now, here's the thing where you got to, you know, you got to think about it. So when we got here to this, we said, uh, oh, if this, uh, if this was a college algebra problem, this would be a, uh, this would be a line in the uh, XY plane. That's what this would be. This also is a line, but uh, in what plane? In the xz plane. So what I'm telling you is that this is a line in the xy plane, and this one uh, in the xz plane. Now, looking at uh, you know any one of these axes, like for example this one right here, uh, the xz plane is uh, you know 
it's this one behind the red one. So like the red thing right there is parallel to the XZ plane. So we're going to do exactly the same thing we did here, except I'm going to draw a line in the XZ plane. That's all, I'm gonna, that's all it is. It's like I just took the problem and I just uh, rotated it a little bit. OK. So this is a sloped line. in uh, the XZ plane. Uh, so for this one, we wanted the x-intercept and the y-intercept for, for, for the first example. So for this one, we were going to want the x-intercept and the z-intercept. OK. So the x-intercept, in this case, wh when, you're, when, you want an I when you want an intercept, what you're really doing is you're wondering, when are the rest of them zero? So over here, the x-intercept meant when y is zero. But uh, here, the x-intercept means what? That means when z is zero. That means when all the other variables are zero. So this is uh, uh, when z is zero. Uh, the resulting equation, ax equal to d and therefore x is d over a. That's the x-intercept. Uh, the z-intercept, z-intercept, this is when x is 0. Uh, so the resulting equation is cz is d. And therefore, solving for z, uh, z is d over c. So we can now draw. And uh, we, we have a, we have an x-intercept and a z-intercept. That means we want to draw a point that is on the z-axis and another point that is on the x-axis. Okay, so one on that one and one on uh, that one. You know, and this is just a, you know an abstract drawing. So I'm just going to make one you know like right there and one right there. It doesn't really matter because we didn't like uh, we didn't set specific values. And then uh, if it was just xz, then uh, we'd be looking at this. But in fact, uh, there's another variable. So what I'm telling you is that uh, this line right here that we've drawn, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what this equation looks like when, uh, when y is 0. But uh, it has to be true for every y, which means that we take this and we just drag it all parallel to the, to the y-axis. So just all the way out. So that means this. So like a nice little, uh, you know, like a ramp. Someone put a ramp inside of their uh, garage. I don't know. I'll put it there. Finally, uh, the last uh, choice is that uh, when a is zero. So in the case uh, that uh, that uh, a is zero, uh, then uh, we have by uh, plus cz is uh, d. Now, this again is a line. Uh, in what plane? In the YZ plane. And uh, because the variables are Y and Z, that means we want the Y intercept and the Z intercept. So the Y intercept, that's when Z. Is zero, uh, so the resulting equation is by is d, and uh, solving for y, therefore we have y is uh, uh, d over b. Uh, the uh, that was a y uh, z intercept. Uh, that's when y is zero. Uh, so the resulting equation is cz is d. And therefore, uh, z is d over c. So we were able to find them. Uh, then the picture looks like this. x, y, z, like so. 
Uh, then we want to draw something in the YZ plane. Now, where is the YZ plane? Right. It's uh, it's this one. Uh, it's in the plane of the page. It's uh, it's that one right there that you can see. That's the YZ plane right there. So what we're talking about is that there's some line that's uh, that's there. So again, you know, just uh, draw two points there. So you know, those are the x and y intercept. Now you draw a line. And if this were a college algebra problem, that would be the end of it, right? <laughs> but it's uh, not. So this is, this is the answer uh, in the specific case when x is 0, but it needs to be true for all such x's. So we need to take this line and drag it out uh, with x. So. All right, and uh, what time is? Yeah, we don't have enough time to do the last case. Uh, I'll I'll just draw it, and then I'll talk about it specifically on Tuesday. So here's uh, here's what I want you to see, uh, observe the pattern. Okay. In case the pattern was not already apparent, and that is that uh, in this case, how many intercepts are there? Just one, right? The question is, how many of the axes do we hit? Well, one, and then we never hit any of the others. Just one, never hit any of the others. Just one, we never hit any of the others. Right? Uh, this, this, is a, this is elevated. This is like a ceiling. How many times does this red uh, roof touch the x-axis? None, right? It's like asking, you see the roof, you see the ceiling edge. How many times does the ceiling edge touch the floor? It, it doesn't, right? Same, uh, same idea here. So there's just one intercept. One intercept, one intercept. In this case, two intercepts, two intercepts, two intercepts. The last case is that uh, there's three intercepts, and we'll talk about it uh, carefully uh, next week, but uh, just to give you a very quick drawing, it's really the easiest of all. Is that uh, now there's just uh, three intercepts, so like, you know, that one, that one, and uh, that one, say. Then, uh, you know, you just draw lines like, uh, okay, there's one, there's one, there's one. You know, that's, the, just, that's just the bit of the plane that you can see, but you've got to understand that you know, it continues going that way and that way all the, all the ways. But uh, if you were just putting this like in the corner of a room, that's what it would look like. Finally, just to give you some idea of where, where it kind of goes from here, is that uh, what if we were looking at this, uh, what if we were looking at a picture, say, uh, from the back? So if this is uh, Z and this is X and Y, and this is uh, Z, and uh, we're viewing this like from uh, outside of the room, which is to say that this is going, uh, this is going into the page, and uh, this one is also going into the page. They're both going into the page. Then, uh, and if that one is still Z, my question to you is, is which one is X and which one is Y? If, if that's going in and that one's going in. The one on the right is x. Uh, it has to be that way because in the end, uh, another way to visualize the rule is that uh, you align your thumb with the output axis, your right thumb, and then it has to be the case that uh, from the first axis, your fingers curl to the second. First, second. So that means that one has to be x. Alternatively, remember that uh, you know, from, viewed from above, the North Pole, if you're looking at the North Pole from above, the Earth should be spinning counterclockwise, which means that the positive symbol is, uh, you know, like this. That's that's positive, which means that uh, that means that uh, this one has to be the first axis because you follow the first, and then the second. So, first, second. 
x, y. So, you know, I'm just uh, saying, you know, uh, I can appreciate that uh, drawing the pictures is a little bit uh, difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the engineering students have uh, problems even, you know, on top of problems because, not <laughs> because uh, it, basically we make them draw, we draw, make them draw like this. And, you know, we'll give them a drawing like this and then say, okay, now here's an axis and, it, you know, it might even be turned, you know, and say, okay, now draw it. You know, and then, <laughs> you know, it's hard. Good. Any questions before we have the, the thing? All right.